Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii are the effects of head trauma, a looming threat to kids' participation in sports. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Malia Maddock. Over the past two school years, there were more than 900 concussions reported by student athletes in Hawaii, primarily from playing football and girls soccer. Are players being encouraged to play rougher? Is the safety equipment not strong enough? Or are we just more aware of the danger of concussions? Are parents pushing their student athletes too hard? We invite you to join our conversation by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments. Now to our panel. Rich Miano is the head football coach at Kaiser High School. Rich himself sustained multiple concussions during his long career playing football in high school, college, and at the highest level of the National Football League. Ross Oshiro is the co-director of the Hawaii Concussion Awareness and Management Program, which monitors all of Hawaii's students from kindergarten through 12th grade. Janelle Nomura is a former college and high school basketball player who sustained eight concussions while playing. Janelle is now a basketball coach at Mid-Pacific Institute and a student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Dr. Rachel Cole is the medical director at the Queens Center for Sports Medicine. Dr. Cole also serves as the staff physician for all teams at Hawaii Pacific University. Thank you all for being here. Let's start, Dr. Cole, with you. What is a concussion and why is this such a hot topic right now? So a concussion, I like to break it into simple terms. So a concussion really is to be thought of as a transient or temporary injury to the brain and it, and it truly is an injury to the brain that when it occurs, it can disrupt the normal function of the brain. And to my patients who are younger, I'll often explain it as like a computer that's a desktop and you unplug it and it has to reboot. So it's a temporary problem. And during that time, that computer has lost its function just like your brain has lost its function. And the goal or the hope would be that it regains full function. And I think why um, this is such an important topic and why it's just such a hot topic is, in fact, we just don't know a lot about it, but yet we keep seeing cases of it. And we are learning more as we go, but we really don't know a lot. And I think that's where it's become such an important question. We know there's more research that needs to be done so we can gather those answers and protect ourselves. Janelle, you had personal experience with this quite recently. How did concussion change your life? Basically, I think it changed my life because this was my last concussion and I had no choice in the decision. So the UH team doctor just said, no, this is any career for your safety. And so after that, it was more of a type of dangerous situation where I thought before it was just, oh, another concussion, it's okay. Five weeks later, I'll be playing. Now it's like, after this concussion, we don't know what's going to happen to you. You're racking up the concussions. You know, serious problems might occur thereafter. So after that, I was thinking, oh no, you know, something serious might happen. It's not just a broken wrist. It's brain effects. And if I can't think normally, that, that actually really scared me. Ross, are you seeing a lot of this in terms of statewide in the different schools, this issue becoming sort of in the center of people's minds? Yeah, I think it is. It's in media, it's on parents, it's coaches. Um, everybody involved is, is really aware of, of the concussions. And I think we're getting better at knowing the signs and symptoms of concussions. But like Janelle is talking about, it's the after effects of what happens to the student after the concussion. And because parents forget, because it's not visible, you look fine on the outside, but on the inside, it's still recovering. And it can take weeks, it can take months for them to recover. And the younger the child is, the longer they take to recover. Would you say, Rich, that there's been a huge change in consciousness on this issue since you were playing in high school and college and even in the NFL? I'm not sure when I was playing in high school or college or in the NFL in the 80s and the 90s that this was even a topic. Mm -hmm. And when um, I was first approached with the NFL concussion lawsuit, my wife immediately said, we've never sued anybody. And after thinking about this, it wasn't a matter of suing, especially for a money grab. It was more of an educational grab because we knew the importance of concussions. And in order to get that out there, this NFL concussion lawsuit, I think, has done more 
for the education from Pop Warner to the AYSO to basketball to all sports, even skateboarders and recreational athletes than anything could have possibly been done. So I'm very pleased with where the lawsuit went in terms of an educational standpoint. And you're referring to the what is seen to be a $765 million lawsuit. Can you just give people who aren't familiar with it sort of how that lawsuit came about? Well, it came about, I, I think, because uh, attorneys realized uh, the, not only the importance but the potential uh, windfall in terms of money. They were originally talking about a two to four billion dollar settlement which would have had universal health coverage for the 18,000 former NFL players that are walking the streets. So obviously they didn't get the amount of money or the amount of coverage they would have got. But I think in the end the educational opportunity as well as taking that money to the players who have severe uh, cognitive effects. And um, th I think that's been fantastic, and that's where the money should go. While we're talking about this lawsuit, let me ask you and sort of play devil's advocate for a moment. For those people out there who might say, hey, everyone knows football is a tough sport. Professional players are played very, very well to get in there and do it. Why go back and sue? Well, again, I think from an edu educational standpoint, and I also think that as well as professional athletes are being paid today. This lawsuit is going all the way back to the early days of the National Football League and more important as we talked about to children and recreation and other sports as well. So I don't, I think probably some people were in it for the money and sometimes that's what people talk about being lawyers and all these other things. But I think more importantly people were in it for the right reason and that's if there was no money distributed whatsoever this would be a great educational opportunity and the fact that there is money being distributed to some of these players that have no pensions have no insurance made a relative large amount of money for a few years they need medical coverage and I think it's uh, that's what it's for and it's done a great job of, uh, of be being what it, you know being distributed so these changes serve in rules, this education that's coming up because of things like this lawsuit. Ross, can you tell us a little bit what sort of changes are being made to try to protect kids in sports? Um, I, I think this started probably back in 2010. Um, and that's when the National Federation of High School um, Associations uh, made a change to their, their uh, rules of the game. And they started with football and they basically said that if any athlete showed any sign or symptom of a concussion, they were to be removed from the game and to be evaluated by the healthcare professional. And that went from football that year to every single sport. Um, and I think it's, it's just gone down to Pop Warner now um, that it's the same. And AYSO has rules now. HISA, the youth, um, Hawaii Youth Soccer Association also has rules about this. Um, so the awareness about what to do, I think, is there for all the sports um, and I think it's just gotten better and better. Um, the National Athletic Trainers Association, they have um, guidelines on how an athlete should be returned to play and that I think is a big piece of an athlete's return to play, um, uh, function, return back to function because it's a stepwise process. They don't go from being hurt right back onto the field like how back when Rich played, that's basically what happened. You got concussed, you're back in the game tomorrow uh, but now you have a stepwise process which may take you a week to get back onto the field and that's without having any symptoms. Or like Janelle, you might not get back into the sport if it's deemed too dangerous. How did that feel when the physician told you that? That had to have been hard. Yeah, it was, it was hard. Um, there's no sugarcoating that. Um, but again, I think I had an open mind about it. You know, I knew the risks. So of course did I want to play Yes, I did, but calculating everything, you know, looking at my future, because I'm, I'm, well, back then I was 21, you know, I still got a long life ahead of me, I think, so <laughs> thinking about that, I think my open mind kind of helped me ease it, but definitely there's been, you know, effects from it, so it was hard to swallow, for sure. Rachel, can you talk about why this is so serious? I, I suppose we do need to get into CTE. Can you explain what CTE is? So CTE stands for chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is a big long word, which is why we call it CTE. It used to be known in the 20s as punch drunk, and it was referring to boxers, and then it became known in medicine as dementia pugilistica, again referring to boxers. What separates CTE now from back then is that we've learned that 
um, these effects don't aren't necessarily just in boxers. That other sports, and it doesn't even have to be a sport, there's been studies even on a circus clown who was shot from a cannon. Um, so that we know that impact, and it doesn't even have to be to the head, it can be to the body, it could be a whiplash effect. So um, what the idea of CTE is, is that with repeated blows to the head or the body, that causes the brain to basically twist or shake within the skull. And in a sense cause damage. Um, and, and the damage might be permanent, and there's categories of damage that they're still trying to classify, um, whether that be the way we think, meaning cognition, our emotions, the way we move, like our motor skills, um, and even things like uh, depression, suicidality. Paranoia. Paranoia. There's a, um, a lot of different twists. That they've had um, some looks at brains, truly brain specimens, and they found certain proteins called tau proteins in the brain. Um, and again, what's interesting about that is it looks slightly different than what we would see perhaps in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. But I have to classify that by saying on the flip side to that, there's a second school of thought, which is that actually CTE isn't a truly separate phenomenon. It's actually just an early manifestation of what we were sort of predestined to become, meaning that that athlete was prone to Alzheimer's based either on their genetics or, or, or just that was just who they were going to become, or Parkinson's or depression. Um, and this repeated hit to the head maybe triggered that at an earlier age than what we might have seen it. So there's probably no question that in the long run, concussions repeatedly over time may have some kind of uh, effect. We don't know yet what that effect is, and I think that's the challenge. So there might be two professional players. They both get a similar amount of concussions. One goes on and gets CTE, and sadly, a lot of times, it basically means ending their life you know, um, and the other one is walking around and okay, and it might be that genetics play a part in it. Is that correct? And I think we don't actually know if 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 that um, if that's even true in the sense that we don't even know if CTE exists. I think we we have that theory. The problem or the limitation we have right now is that it's what we call a case study, meaning um, we have a, a selection of of athletes, a particular group and we're following that group. Um, but we haven't done what we call in science as sort of the highest or strongest level of evidence, which is what we call a randomized control trial, meaning we have a control group and a group of athletes and we study them going into the future. So we would need to take a group of players now and follow them for 50 years. That hasn't been done and that's where our limitation right now is. It's a long time to wait yeah. for that answer. <laughs> right. Exactly. Rich, I was thinking of you as I was reading about this because I was wondering if I had had a number of concussions in professional football and you're seeing former peers, you know, whose lives are ending very poorly with this. Do you worry? Do you look at sort of any changes in how you're feeling and wonder, or does it not enter your consciousness on that level? Well, um, Peter King called me from Sports Illustrated, and he was talking about Andre Waters as well as Dave Dorson. They were both 50 years old and both shot, killed themselves, basically uh, committed suicide. At that time, I'm 51 now, but I was 50 as well. I knew both of them. And it was, um, so it really kind of hit home in terms of what seemed to be great professional careers, made lots of money, uh, seemed to be living the life that they wanted to live. All of a sudden, like Junior Seau, took a turn for the worse. Mm -hmm. So I consider myself asymptomatic, but you, my, I think my wife would argue that, as well as some <laughs> of my assistant coaches and people that I'm around. But it, it's when... And the great thing about this lawsuit is, is I'll, I'll be medically monitored for the next, for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And so if any of these uh, uh, signs of dementia or Alzheimer's or any of the other things associated with uh, traumatic hits, I will be hopefully medically cared as well as compensated for my family. So, but yeah, I do worry. I think that who knows when that time is gonna come. And I'm at that age now where like like Doc said, will, will it be a natural thing or will it be because of I had 700 tackles and I played football for 25 years and the multiple hits to the head and that will be, hopefully, I'll live a long, healthy life because I'm trying to be a centurion. Yeah, of course. <laughs> now, of course, Janelle, you don't have a lawsuit that you're involved with. Do you worry about long-term effects of concussion or do you feel like by the doctor pulling you out of play that you're going to be all right? Um, I definitely worry. and. Coincidentally, that junior say out um, incident that happened relatively close to my last concussion. So that was really on my mind, you know. And like I said, I had an open mind and was thinking about the future, not just right now, the future. And it, yeah, it did scare me. And 
I think the help I'm getting now is fantastic. You know, if, if I didn't have support system or people to talk to or doctors to see on a regular basis, you know, I wouldn't, I don't know where I would be right now, so. What is the therapy for post-concussion? What sort of treatment is there? I mean, and if it gets as serious as CTE, is there any going back? Well, that's the challenge is that once we see those signs, really, you know, you can put people on medications for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, but we don't have CTE medications. We don't have CTE therapy. There's no therapy for that. Right. No. We have certain therapies to help if you have lasting symptoms um, or signs from your concussion, meaning, for example, if you have balance problems mm -hmm. or you have vision problems, we have things like vestibular physical therapy that may help you regain some of that balance um, or some of those um, vision losses that you're experiencing. But we don't have the magic pill, which is what we're lo we would love to look for. We're starting to get questions. I think this one's interesting, and it actually um, goes to a League of Denial, a, a program that was on PBS, and it was a quote from that, um, from Susan on Molokai. In response to tonight's topic, if it takes only 10% of mothers concerned stop their children from playing, then I hope it happens, and uh, that the warrior spirit. My question is, are there organizations similar to MAD for traumatic brain sport injuries? So what she's referring to is it's mentioned as a quote that if 10% of mothers in the United States feel that football is too dangerous, that could be sort of the end of football, is sort of a, a quote that is thrown around by an unnamed NFL um, member. Any thoughts on that? Well, um, real quickly, that metrics is exactly correct because there were 10.1 million football players last year. There are only 9.1 million this year that play organized tackle football. So you've lost 10%. 10%. So I would imagine that it's probably more because of the legal denial, the book that came out, as well as all this uh, information that's coming out. The NHL is going to announce a lawsuit very shortly with some big name players. The Hockey League. The Hockey League, yes, the National Hockey League, which is not really well known in Hawaii. But yes, that's going to be another huge lawsuit as well, and another violent game that, again, is going to bring attention to this. And, and everybody, you know, you, you, you referred back to the money. It's really not, I don't think, about the money. I really think it's about the medical coverage of these players that sacrificed for the players that are making such great money today. Well, Ross, you're on the front line in terms of schools. You see sort of that spectrum. Are we seeing people leave football? High school football, um, I, I don't think the numbers are, are dropping significantly. Um, in certain areas, I think it's a natural decrease because of the population in the area. Meaning? Uh, smaller, uh, okay. older schools, the, so gotcha. the, the, the okay. kids are all are, are growing up. Right. Um, I, I definitely think there is, is a decrease in the Pop Warner. Um, I think there's so many more um, avenues for these kids to participate in with FLAG, um, I-9. Um, they're all over the place, they're, and they're all year round. Um, so there's other options for parents to choose from. Just what Ross is saying, that in flag football is the fastest growing youth sport, yeah. so that's exactly correct. So then people are having uh, their children play flag, but doesn't that lead to tackle? I, I, think, I think that it's a transition to that point, but I think these kids are learning the fundamentals, so the, learning how to run, learning how to catch, mm -hmm. learning the routes, learning to love the sport, and I think that's an important thing that they develop at an early age. And then as they get older, the parents, the kids, they can make the choice of whether I want to go and play contact football. Um, and then again, it becomes a coaching of how well they're, they're taught on how to tackle, um, how to keep their head up, how to protect themselves from the hit. Um, and I think part of that has, has changed the game the way, especially this year with, with um, the changes in NFL and um, um, college and in high schools with the hit, uh, helmet to helmet hits. That's changed the game. And I think it's gonna change the game even more until everybody makes the, the correct tackle t tackling techniques. Um, and I think that's where it's gonna start from. So the referees need to make the call, the coaches need to make the proper adjustments in learning how to tackle correctly. And then the athletic trainers need to do their job when these kids do get it. Heard. And it seems like it is kind of a learning curve in terms of adjusting to these new rules. I've seen a few games where they, the commentator said, oh, the player was trying to not to follow this new rule and it ended up being another kind of collision or awkward or a, a penalty. Right? Yeah, and I think Doc can speak more uh, about in terms of a young person's brain development, in terms of when should 
you actually put on a helmet and tackle. And, you know, I probably receive uh, some backlash in terms of I think that it shouldn't be till high school. The Pop Warners and that playing flag football teaches all the fundamentals of the game. You can learn how to tackle. And is it necessary for a young person to be hitting each other in the head? I personally don't think so. And I'm a parent as well. And I wouldn't let my son play until he was in high school. I wanted to play at that level. So I think there's a lot of good things that are happening. And um, it's, it's, it's soccer. I mean, just hitting the ball in terms of that's, that's probably where you're getting more concussions than football because of the amount of soccer players. But you know, football is obviously in terms of the edu educational front. Right. And this is, the, oh, no, no, I was going to say this is actually a very interesting question because this is actually being thrown around in the in the medical society. So in our sports medicine uh, associations, this is one of the biggest conversations we're now having is is sort of rule changes. So when is the brain too young to head a ball and sort of the age. Uh, the theory there is when it, do we have the neck strength to, to support heading the ball and the proper technique uh, and to sustain that force so that the, the brain isn't being affected. And we think that probably at least 11, um, maybe even older than that, and same goes for football, really, as we've said, probably the fundamental skills are really the, the crux of the sport. And if we can kind of nail those down in an early age and avoid tackling and, and talk about some rule changes that even in the high school, no, no contact during practice, that contact is really reserved for games um, and, and really reduce the, the number of impacts that we have. And, and so we're talking about um, things like in, in ice hockey, about checking, that really um, youth should not be checking and that really we should reserve that for maybe 16 and above. Um, and I think we'll see that in probably a lot of sports. That's going to be one of the hot topics too. Is, is the rule changes um, at the you know even all the way down to the elementary and and public leagues uh, as well as up through the high schools. Have you had any pushback on rule changes at all? Any people who think that it could negatively impact the sport that players won't be as skilled, they won't learn how to do things. There, there's always that that group that says um, it's going to decrease my 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 attendance. Uh, so soccer is a good example of that. Um, and Pop Warner is another one. Uh, because there are so many kids that participate in soccer from five years old all the way up to um, college and pros, um, they, with soccer, they start with a smaller ball to begin with. Um, and then they get onto a bigger ball. But it's, it's, again, the education to these young coaches that hitting, teaching a kid how to head the ball once or twice a practice, not 20 or 30 times, that multiple hitting is, 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 is the doing the damage to these kids. And of course, it's not, the funny thing is we've got a, a, a comment from Michael in Kahului. People aren't aware of the fact that it's not necessarily contact sports alone that present the risk of concussion. Surfing can be dangerous too. Exactly. Collar was sucked under the waves on two separate occasions and suffered transient amnesia. And a, a friend was telling me about cheerleaders that they have in a concussion yeah. clinic. It's just. Yeah. Right, football by far is the big number on these things and, and soccer, but there's all sorts of sports. Well, baseball is gonna eliminate any collisions at home plate and the purest of, you know, the pugilists are always upset about taking the violent hits out of football, which has been marketed for years. Same thing in hockey. I was just at a game in Boston, the Boston Bruins, and this literally was, they encourage fighting, they let them fight and it goes to the ground and then they try to break it up. But the guy was on the ice and he got his head pounded into the ground and that, he was carried off in a stretcher because he was knocked out. And a lot of this is precautionary because he's probably not paralyzed. But the thing is, that's assault. I mean, and, and this is what we've seen in hockey and in boxing and in and, and ultimate fighting and all these other things. And it's interesting that all these sports are becoming safer for the right reasons. And it's interesting you say that because um, this one study that I was reading, and I wanted to ask everyone about it, particularly Janelle, it found that half of high school athletes say they would lie about headaches and other symptoms to avoid losing their sport. Mm -hmm. That to me is very interesting because you can change as many rules as you want, but you can't unless until you've changed that mindset, right? There's it. Janelle, could you give us sort of a little insight to maybe why a young athlete might feel that way? I'm not going to deny I might have lied about one or two concussions really? because for the same reason because you don't want to let's say it's finals week or state finals whatever championship ILH league championships mm -hmm. and then you might have suffered a blow to the head okay you know you're going to be out mm -hmm. and do you want to be out for that particular period of time no especially if you're one of the leading scorers or team captains or a leader on that team, you know, I think as a player you feel a responsibility. Well, at least I do. Mm -hmm. So for those reasons, I might have lied. So 
I, I can see why players do lie. And then later in my career in college, when after you said 2010, when things started coming up more about concussions, that's when I became a little more worried about it and was more precautious about it. But before that, before any education, I wasn't worried about anything. I, I, we've done educational talks, and our first one was one of my former athletes, uh, Darnell Arsenal. And he surprised me at this presentation. He basically told me he hid concussions from me while I was the athletic trainer at, at, at St. Louis. And I've had discussions with other pro athletes, Ronnie Lott for one, and he basically said he had 20 concussions throughout his career. Wow. And he, he hid them. And everybody at that at conference, based professional football players, they all said they would have hid the concussions because they wanted to play. It was their way out of wherever they come from. Right. There's and economics involved, yeah. too. And the biggest High thing stakes. that that Ronnie said is that if, if, if he was to play now, he would change the way that he plays. Mm. He would still play as hard as he did, but he would change the way that he hits. And he was a heavy hitter from back then. He, at a matter of fact, he talked to me at Cook Field about, you know, because I was the same position as him. And he said, you know, pick and choose your hits in the NFL because you only have so many hits in you. But going back to that, it's referred to the C word because if you're a college athlete like Janelle playing, or you're playing football, the, if you have a certain amount of concussions, you're done. Now, you'll medical hardship and you'll still get your scholarship, but you can no longer play the game you love. And, Unrealistically, most players that play college football think they're going to play in the National Football League, so they don't want their careers to end because mm -hmm. they're trying to go to the NFL, and the NFL will not draft you if you, they, they know you have a certain amount of head trauma and concussions because now they're liable with this concussion lawsuit and everything else to have to pay for the, you the rest of your life. Right. You have very so, little wiggle room. So that brings us... I just wanted to add something. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that we hide it or fake it because it's easy to fake. You can't see it. You can't take an x-ray and say you have a concussion. It's not like you broke a finger, take an x-ray, you can see the fracture. So it's easy, easy to hide, but then it's also the most dangerous thing to hide yeah. because you're dealing with motor function and all that kind of other stuff. So. And I think we're, we're, what I'm learning from all the people that have I've gone into these presentations and done presentations is that we need to change the way that we educate kids. We can't educate a college kid the way we educate a high school kid, a middle school kid. So when we do presentations, we have to make it specific to that age group because high school kids don't want to be told all the bad stuff that's going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. They need to be educated on why I need to tell my coach that I, had a, I, I feel dizzy or I have a headache. So they need to know why they need to do that. And the middle school kid is a little bit different. And if, even a great uh, elementary school kid, it's going to have to be changed the way we do some education. And is the thinking of taking an athlete out when you hear about that concussion that they are more susceptible and vulnerable to a second concussion going back in? So that's, that you've got this dangerous window. <coughs> is right. That so the, there's no question, even though we don't know a lot about concussion, there's no question that we, we do know that, first of all, the symptoms um, end, end up being sort of additive, meaning if you get another concussion when you've already experienced one, <clears throat> you're more likely to suffer longer symptoms, more severe symptoms. And, and secondly, when you're currently suffering one, there's actually could be severe consequences, meaning if you don't let yourself um, fully heal and you get back out there and take another hit, um, you can actually have, uh, in a sense, most severe brain reactions where you could have seizures um, or you know be hospitalized. And so it's, it's a very serious thing not to uh, admit the concussion. And one of the things we actually didn't talk about is sort of what does a concussion look like? Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the biggest misconceptions is that a concussion has to have loss of consciousness. That was always something we always thought that, you know, that you, you pass out, you lose consciousness, when actually really only about a quarter of concussions have loss of consciousness. So to fake it, like you mentioned, um, and to try to, you know, if you can kind of keep your balance and kind of think straight, right. and you can pull it off even though your head is ringing. And, and you're not having, say you have a headache. Right, right, and just not admit the headache or any of, maybe the vision changes or some of the things that are bothering you, like light sensitivity, yeah. you could fake it. Is it kind of like when you think of Muhammad Ali, who's obviously suffering from Parkinson's and, and, and seems like he's in a rapid decline, when you look at someone like George Foreman, who seems so cognitive and seems so witty and seems to be somewhat asymptomatic, are people different in terms of the ability to take hits to the head? Is it because of the skull, the brain, the physiology, the physicalness of, 
you know, why is it that it seems that some people are more susceptible than others? There's a, you know, that's a really good question. There's a lot of theories about that. One of the theories is that actually our skulls aren't all shaped similarly. So some people actually may have a little bit more room in the skull and they have more fluid around the brain or cerebral spinal fluid so that the brain, if, if you do take a hit to the body or the, or the head, that brain has more room to move and some people have less room and so it's going to have more of an effect. Other people think there may be a genetic predisposition. There's a gene called APOE or APOE3 or 4. And, and that gene, we think, may predispose you to having um, chronic changes in your brain. Um, and some of it we just don't know. And that's interesting because you say theories, right? And then the 50-year the study, right? So there's, what scared me the most is that there's no concrete evidence, you know? And I felt like I was in the middle of something new. So you're talking about rule changes, you know? That's what really scared me the most because I felt like I was in something that was just coming up. Well, and you bring a good point, which is when I see patients in, in the office, I mean, that's one of the hardest conversations I have. One of the most challenging patients I see are the concussion patients. I see everything from fractures to sprains and strains, and I may sit people out all the time. But to talk about what your life will look like 50 years mm -hmm. from now, I don't have those answers. And I think that's hard for anybody to make that choice, whether they should go back and play. And I think the education for a coach is when you talk about hamstrings, you talk about broken bones and everything else, there may be some conversation. But as a coach, when you talk about concussions, you have to defer to the doctor and the trainer and, and really take a cautious approach. And, and it's hands off and it's your decision now. It's out of the coach's hands. I, I think what you talk about, too, is that you can lie about it, you can hide it. But what's probably helped us the most in the high schools, we have an objective test that we give now. It's called an impact test. It's a neuropsych test that's a computerized test. And it provides us a base. We do a baseline on, the, on all our athletes at ninth and 11th grade. So if they get concussed, we compare that score to the baseline test. And it's an objective piece of data that we have. And it's probably the, the only objective piece that we have besides balance testing. Um, but if you have a strong core, you can kind of get by with that as well. But it's probably what's going to change and is changing probably in the last year is this vestibular um, therapy and vestibular um, ex um, assessments that we can do. We can look at their eyes, their balance, and compare it with our impact scores, and we can get a better idea of where this athlete's going to get to or how long their um, concussion may last. And you had mentioned that your own daughter sustained concussions during, was it soccer? During soccer, yeah. What, if you were to sort of restart the beginning with uh, your daughter in sports, would you have done anything differently? Probably the biggest change would have been starting her, getting her neck stronger and her core stronger at an earlier age. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one thing that we can change. Uh, we can't change the genetics of the person, so we can change their strength wise and um, the other part that's hard is to change that mentality of how aggressive they, they play and it's like what I guess Ronnie says is you pick your your hits you pick when you're gonna be aggressive and go after a ball or go after an athlete. And, when it's worth. and Rich you were mentioning you've got a son and he's not playing football right now is right. that correct? Tell me yes. about that I think that's interesting. Well he, I think he looks at the game mm -hmm. and wants to play sometimes but I think he's close enough to the game, want to see the dangers, and I think my, my wife is definitely part of that 10% of soccer moms are moms that understand that this trauma is not worth it. And as fortunate as I was to play in the NFL for a long time, what's the chances of my son playing in the NFL? So we, we are so much more about education and going to college and how important your brain is and do you really need this repetitive hits to your head versus playing basketball and learning all the things you can learn in other sports. But I think football is the greatest game in the world, but you have to make sure that it's taught properly and you're very educated on the concussions because when they do occur, you have to take the proper uh, necessary um, steps. So if he really wants to do it in high school or college, will you for, yes. You'll be okay with that. Yes, and, and because like Ross was talking about before, the, it's changed so much. When you talk about Junior Seau, 20 years of the National Football League, and if you average 100 tackles a year, that's 2,000 tackles. But you're forgetting about every single day in practice in the 80s and the 90s and the, in, in the early 21st century of how many tackles were made in practice. You don't tackle in practice right. anymore. So all of those things have made the game so much safer. And Rachel, I'm assuming with your children, you'll wait till they're 11 before they start hitting those balls with their head, right? right? Yeah, and I've even, I have actually seen an athlete who had a concussion from heading 50 soccer balls, you know, and so I think it comes down to what we used to do 
and what we will do and what we maybe we think we, we should do at this point are, are going to be different things and we'll know more as we go. Do you know when you have your children, will you have sort of mixed feelings about them going into sports? Um, I haven't thought about that, but <laughs> now that you, <laughs> you bring should. that up. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you have so, to worry about it. Don't yeah. worry about it now. Let's go to a question from Jill in um, Manoa. Have there been any studies done to determine the effectiveness of padding the exterior of sports helmets in addition to the interior? And it, while we're talking about this, I've heard chatter about, oh, those plastic football helmets. Maybe they're part of the problem, you know? Maybe they're not the best protection. Any thoughts? Football helmets were never meant to prevent a concussion. They're meant to prevent a skull fracture. And all the padding in the world is not gonna do that, prevent the concussion. Um, it's it's going to prevent the skull fracture. And the best example I've heard about this is from a doctor um, uh, from Pittsburgh. And he basically talks about a woodpecker. And the woodpecker has a tongue that wraps around the brain itself. So when a woodpecker makes a hit with his, with his beak, this, this tongue wraps around his skull to encase it or it's his brain to encase it, so it's, it's, it's stabilized as he's making these repetitive hits. And we can't mimic that in a football helmet. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, no matter what kind of helmet you buy, how expensive helmet it's you buy, it's not gonna do it. You, you know, and just talking about that, there was a player by the name of Mark Kelso in the 80s, and he had a big coating over his helmet. He looked like kazoo or something. You know, <laughs> it was just unbelievable, like the kid in the Jack in the Box commercial. And that was supposedly to try to help. But when this concussion lawsuit was taking place, they pretty much eliminated the helmet manufacturers because it's really not their fault. Because it's like, like Ross was saying, it's not really going to protect you from a concussion. Yeah. It's you can hit your head on the ground. It yeah. doesn't even have to be a helmet to helmet type yeah. of hit and get a concussion. So there's no sort of silver bullet in terms of equipment that could help. Let's go to Mike from Hilo. I'm a football and wrestling referee. We have been increasing our illegal helmet contact foul calls, but we get a lot of pressure from coaches, parents, and players to quote, let the kids play, unquote. When you become known as a referee who kicks out players, you can forget ever refereeing championship games. Interesting, any thoughts on that? First of all, I don't think that's true. I think um, in terms of when they grade referees, and we just had our high school football um, meeting with the referees, there's, I think there's 8,842 uh, penalties this year based upon helmet-to-helmet -helmet hits. And my question was, is how many were on the offense? Because what we are concerned about is if an offensive player lowers his head and a defensive player lowers his head, that's basically what you're taught to get low center of gravity in order to uh, keep your forward progress. And on defense, it's the same thing. And in order to prevent that forward progress, you want to get lower. So low man wins, so to speak. But it's always called on the defense, where it should be called almost on an equal basis on the offense if this is going to be a rule that's going to impact this game. So I think that it's called like it, it's, it's usually when you put in a new rule, it's overly called because they're very... Uh, receptive of this and they're very responsible about this new rule change but what happens is in football it's basically it kind of plays itself out because turning your head on a football tackle now you're talking about neurological things pinched nerves all these other things and basically hitting face to face is a lot safer than trying to place your helmet on the side of somebody's sternum or somebody's chest so it's an, it's an interesting topic. It's such a tough call for these officials, but we as coaches need to know that we'd rather them err on the side of cautious and understand that we cannot continue to let people hit each other with their helmets. But it sounds from this caller as if that's not necessarily the feelings he's encountering when he does this. Russ, do you have any thoughts on that? I think the referee's job, they, they have a, uh, a difficult job, especially with these new rule changes, um, because not everybody understands the rule changes and why the rule changes were, were made. Um, and it's going to take some time for that to happen. Um, but their, their job is, to, is the safety of the athletes on the field. That and has to come first. Yeah. Um, can the brain heal completely after you've suffered a concussion, or will there always be residual damage? A caller from Kailua. Rachel, let me ask you that. That's one of our tough questions. So we believe yes. We believe yes that a, a, technically by definition a concussion falls under a, a title of mild traumatic brain injury or mild TBI. So we think of it on the more mild spectrum. And so if that's the case, we really do believe you could 
fully heal, and you could probably speak to that. I've had yeah. two, three concussions myself, and um, I think I've healed completely. From sports? Yeah. From sports, From yeah. soccer? You yes. still seem to be very intellectual, so <laughs> you're doing fine. I'm a geek, There's yeah. No yeah. So from soccer, okay. So from soccer, from actually from paddling, yeah. from a, a boat hooling. So mm -hmm. um, it's it's possible, like I said, to, to fully recover. What we're more concerned about is this additive effect, that it's not the one it's not the two, it's when we start, you know, six, seven, eight. And the problem is we don't have the number. Mm -hmm. um, and we also don't know the force. Is it eight hard ones? Is it one, one, you know, one little one with 10 hard ones? We don't really know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the formula yet. And, and again, I, I feel like all night, that's what I'm saying is we don't know. And I think that's where um, we need to work. Janelle, I know you have the emotional after effects of having had to give up playing a sport you really love. Do you feel that you've continued to have health after effects? Um, definitely. Mm -hmm. I've had difficulty struggling with, see the problem is there's a lot of unknowns so I'm not sure if it's due to the concussion alone mm -hmm. with the effects or the effects of, you know, being abruptly taken away from mm -hmm. the thing you love most right. and other things, you know, I'm not sure what it is, you know, but yeah. there's definitely been after effects and it's funny that you talk about force because one of my worst concussions was just in a car accident so mm -hmm. you know there's a we I was in the car with my twin sister and unfortunately we hit somebody from behind and I just had this sh whiplash yeah. and from that I had a concussion and I tried to lie about it but it was it was just so bad and I was thinking you know I just I didn't hit my head it was just the force and then apparently the, the brain kind of shifted a little and that alone I, w I got like vertigo almost I couldn't stand up balance problems, sensitiv sensitivity to light, and that was in the morning. I couldn't go to class all day, and that was scary because there was no head-to-head -head or impact. It was just on that whiplash alone. So well, and that's why it goes back to even the helmet question. Helmets can't prevent that whiplash effect, yeah. and the same goes to some people have tried the header bands in soccer, which are these padded bands. I've but seen those on children. And that well. makes sense that it would help for a head-to-head -head contact, which is one of the ways soccer players will get concussions, but it's not going to help if, if you had a ball comes, you know, 100 miles an hour so to your head. So it doesn't. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. This is, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think the other piece with what we're talking about, too, is when you talk about um, the headaches, the dizziness, the vertigo, and we have high school kids, middle school kids, and they go to class and they have to sit in class and, and listen to the teacher, take notes, and these concussed kids can't handle that sometimes. And that prolongs their symptoms, that prolongs their concussion, and it's, it's that educating the teachers on what they need to do. And that's something that we've tried to do over the past what year. What do they need to do? What do the it's, it's, one is the teacher needs to know that the child got concussed. Mm -hmm. So mom and dad, especially in the elementary middle school, need to let the school know that the child got concussed so the teacher can keep an eye on the child and see how they're doing in the classroom. Are they putting their head down more often? Are they bothered by the, the lights in the classroom, the sunlight? Um, sometimes even walking down the halls can trigger their symptoms um, and even the volume of the noise. Let me ask a helmet question really quickly since we just brought that up again. This is a question, do the helmets make players feel invincible? Would leather helmets actually be beneficial? Any thoughts on that? That's a great question because when you look at rugby, it doesn't seem to have mm -hmm. as many concussions or as, uh, the serious head injuries. So obviously if you don't have a helmet on, I, I think you'd be more cautious. I remember when I was at the University of Hawaii and I had a helmet that had two of those air type of uh, pressure things that made my helmet seem like I, I was I could run into a wall and I, it wouldn't affect that. But <laughs> so I think the answer to your question is yes. Having a helmet on allows you to be more brave, uh, more courageous, whatever you want to call it, and be able to hit somebody much harder. Because if you don't have a helmet, obviously you're going to have blood and you're going to have you know the the fractures and all those other things. So yes. This question is, what preventative measures are there taken in other sports to prevent concussions? Is the panel aware of the preventative effects of using custom protective mouthpieces? Yes. Any thoughts on that? So the research on that goes the same direction as the helmets and the head headbands for um, soccer, which is that it's there's no question it prevents dental injuries, and that's 100%. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the real um, problem is it doesn't stop the translation of force. The idea would be that you have a padded mouthpiece, right, and that that's going to prevent the transmission of the, the shock wave to the brain, but it, it doesn't work that way. And again, same thing, if the head is whipping back and forth or twisting, it's not going to um, decrease the rates of concussion, unfortunately. But in college, though, I think they are taking those measures. So 
at both schools I was at, um, my first two years I was at Cal State Northridge, we were required to get fitted for mouthpieces, mm -hmm. and then at UH I was also required to get fitted for mouthpieces. So those are the kind of things they're trying to do, because mm -hmm. we can't wear helmets on the basketball court, you know, mm -hmm. but I think they are trying. So. In terms of changes, uh, Rich, any thoughts, and Ross, do you think we should look at further changes in terms of a playing field of eight on eight, rather than standard 11 player? Is there, is there, are there any other changes that could happen? I, you can answer that question better. <laughs> right. I, I don't think you change eight on eight or 11 11. I don't think it's gonna change. The hits are still gonna be the hits. I actually think eight on eight would be more high impact hits because the less players you put on the field, the more mm -hmm. Vertical and horizontal it gets in the in the higher speeds of the collisions. So, the, so I, I think one thing that has changed and if you watch football 10 years ago or 20 years ago versus today is you had more tight ends and fullbacks and all that the game has become more spread out which has become more athletic and it's harder to hit somebody in the head mm -hmm. because you're in space when you're tackling whereas the downhill running of the I formation and the lead plays where Daryl Johnson of the, of the Dallas Cowboys used to lead on the linebacker 50 times a game that linebacker and him were having repetitive hits to the head whereas now the game is much played more in space. Do you think if everyone were honest, they'd say that that kind of drama, that kind of impact, that kind of violence, if you will, makes for exciting TV viewing and that there's a part of some fans that might not find these football games with these changes as exciting? America loves violence. I mean, that's what sells in the UFC. That's what sells in boxing. That's why football is such a popular sport in this country. And it's not universally as accepted as, but American fans love violence. And that's part of the problem. And so the fans need to be responsible too and not, not push for that in professional games. Yeah, because I watch Sports Center almost every night and like, like you said, I don't understand in the National Hockey League why they allow that fight, how they just go at each other one on one. And the fans love it. They're throwing things in there, food, <laughs> drinks, right? They love it, and I just don't understand that. <laughs> it's perpetuated, and even in the commentary, if you listen to the commentary, ooh, what a hit, yeah. and you know, and so that's, and it feeds our kind of our hunger for this this violence, and, and so I, it's coming from all directions. I've even heard some fans that I'm watching a game with say, oh, it's kind of the beginning of the end of football. You know, this is the beginning of the end because it's going to become so hard to play the game with all of the acceleration of rules. Well, I think, I don't know what year Harry Truman was president, but it was at one time there were a bunch of deaths due to football where it was eliminated. And now the game is so popular and there's so many billions of dollars. I think it's $11 billion a year industry in the, in the National Football League alone. So I don't know if you'll ever see it come to that point, but I think you are going to see it where it's going to be somewhat similar to fencing where when you touch the quarterback, he is down because it's a quarterback driven league. It's a star driven league and you have to protect the quarterback. So now you can't even crawl on the ground and touch Tom Brady in his lower extremities. There's all these things that are happening to make the game safer. At the same time, they're aware of what a money making machine this game is. And I don't think it'll ever be eliminated and it shouldn't be eliminated. It just needs to continue to be safer. In terms of changes, let's talk about um, basketball for a second. Any changes you could see in terms of, would you like to see players wear, wear helmets? Would you like to see surfaces be softer? Um, no, definitely I've been told a lot, you should just put a helmet on, you know, but that's never gonna happen. I've also been given the headband, yeah. um, but that can't stop everything. Um, I think the most important thing is education, you know, yeah. with the coaches. So. As a coach, you know, you, you always want your players to give it their best, but sometimes not, I'm not speaking for all coaches, but sometimes coaches might take it a little too far and push a little too much. And I think it's important that coaches get educated to when to pull them out, what's best for the student athlete. Well, that's something that I think is interesting. I certainly can appreciate as a mom of young boys. I mean, all of us are putting so much energy into our kids. And I think a lot of times parents with the best of intentions perhaps you know, there might be sort of putting too much emphasis in terms of practice and sports and, and you know, are we, are we having children sort of play one sport too intensely too young? Are you seeing that? Definitely, and it's not just with concussions, with, it's with all the injuries that we have. We have kids that participate in one sport from five years old, so by the time they're 10 or 12, if they're a baseball player, yeah. their elbow's shot, their yeah. shoulder's shot, and we wouldn't see that until they're in college. Too but, specialized yeah, too soon. Too specialized too soon. They're one-way rotational, so they're imbalanced, uh, causing more problems for them. 
um, the elbows, the shoulders, the backs, and she probably sees it in clinic are all, all day. We are. It's a, it's a category of injury called overuse injury, which makes sense. You're just overusing that same body part over and over, whether you're a baseball pitcher or you're a cross-country runner and you just train all the time and, and are getting stress fractures. And, um, and it is at astronomical rates now compared to even 20 years ago. And we're actually even seeing the phenomenon of burnout in kids, mm -hmm. which is the psychological or emotional component of just, I don't want to do it anymore. And we would never have heard about that really except for maybe some of the most elite athletes 20 30 years ago but we're seeing it fairly frequently in kids who just have been doing it for you know 10 years but they're only 13. Amazing that is that pressure to get scholarships get into schools and be for competitive. Kids, it's their only ticket you know and that's the way they feel and uh, and that's where we hope to encourage you know other means of, of helping you know excite and stimulate kids about school. Both of you guys are coaching currently. Talk to me a little bit about sideline screening. Um, I read uh, that that is something that people are trying to encourage to sort of keep an eye on, on athletes and, and try to catch concussions that perhaps aren't being admitted to by an athlete. Have you had much experience with that? Well, we're blessed in Hawaii to have, in the public school systems, to have two trainers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're blessed at Kaiser to have a doctor as well on the sidelines. But we also have to go through mandatory concussion testing, too, so we, we understand a little bit more of the awareness and the symptoms. So it it's definitely continues to evolve and improve, and, and I think that's really important from head coaches to assistant coaches to uh, from the officials to the doctors and trainers to recognize uh, the early symptoms or if somebody is concussed and to be very uh, cautious about that. Have you had um, athletes that you have a sense might be experiencing those symptoms and are not admitting to it as we spoke about earlier? No question, and, and as Janelle I think referred to, it, I was watching a, a particular drill and I saw that when he, when this young man got up, he was, he didn't have good balance and he wanted to go back in there and I had to literally grab him and take him to the sidelines and get our trainers because sometimes the trainers have so many things on their plate in the, at the high school level that they're not watching and witnessing every single drill. So we have to take that player over and make sure the trainer now does the diagnosis and uh, that, that happens not all the time, but it does happen. This is a comment from Derek, a sports psych psychologist. If overzealous parents and uneducated coaches can de-emphasize winning at the expense of everything, then we can decrease traumatic head sports injuries. Ross, do you, do you agree with that? Do you think there's a lot of that going on? <clears throat> uh, to some extent, yeah. Um, I think it's um, sports has become such a hot topic that we want kids to participate in everything. Sports is great for, for participation, teamwork. It, it teaches us a lot, um, but the emphasis has changed um, to some extent on, on getting that scholarship, getting to the pros, getting, it's because it's so much money involved. Yeah. In terms of sort of um, some of the issues that we see in the future for, for athletes, you were talking about the fact that perhaps CTE and some of the more dramatic, it might be sort of a, a group that would have had those problems anyway, perhaps, it's a possibility. Do you think sort of some of the issues we've seen in athletics like steroids and alcohol, that that could be a factor? Is that part of the medical discussion right now That too? is definitely part yeah. of the medical discussion, that you have to look at the spectrum of, of what these people have done in their lifetime, not just in a snapshot and say, oh, well, you know, football is the only reason this could happen. There could be other reasons, it, and it doesn't have to be something like steroids. It, it could be their nutritional supplements they've been taking. Again, it could be their genetics. There could be so many other factors that play into it um, that we just don't know. And one of the bigger changes could just be that, as you had mentioned, back in the day, you got your bell rung, rub some dirt on it, get back out there. Well, one of the changes we may see is that we are more cautious now, that athletes will be taken care of. They will, you know, seen on the sideline, sit out, gradual return to play over a week's time. You know, there's a, a big difference in the way we're treating concussion. Right. And Ross, you were telling me that, you know, we're seeing these numbers go up on concussions here in Hawaii, but that might be simply a matter of we're talking about this and recognizing it more. I think that's the big piece is coaches, parents are becoming more educated, so they're more aware of what to look for about a concussion, and they're more willing to report the concussions. Right. We if, have a, if you look yeah. in the 80s and the 90s and the concussion reports, there would be none. You look at the NFL injury report every week, how many concussions are reported and how many players are not 
yeah. playing, participating, it's changed uh, tremendously. Just saw, I think there were seven this week and 125 so far this season. I think we have about a minute. Can we go really briefly around? If you could see perhaps one improvement, one change happen, what would it be? Um, just it's kind of a continuum in terms of the continual education and the importance of young people, whether it's skateboarding, riding their bikes with helmets, how they practice, and just everything to do with just uh, education to the parents, to the coaches, to everybody involved in, in sports and recreation. Getting the message out. Janelle. I think speaking for athletes in general, think about the bigger picture, right? It's so important, you think it's so important right now to play, to fake a concussion, it's not. There's a much bigger picture that you need to think about. I, th I think the biggest message is for coaches that are out there, young coaches as well as experienced coaches, is they have such a strong emphasis on their athletes. So making them aware of the concussion and making it okay for their athlete to, to report the concussion is a big key. Right, and let them feel safe about yeah, doing that. Exactly. Rachel. I think it's, it's looking again at, at what we don't know and going forward and exploring those avenues. And I think the second piece on, the, on a real sort of realistic day-to-day -day terms would be knowing that if you do sustain this type of injury that you have resources now, we do know some things about it and we have ways to help. Don't, don't fail to seek that help. Go and see your doctor. Um, find those avenues, whether it's physical therapy or it's appropriate rest or school help, school plans. There are ways to help you kind of deal with this injury and move forward. All right, thanks for helping us get the message out about this tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Next time on Insights, our state lawmakers are poised to gather at the state capitol on January 15th to spend the next 120 days discussing the merits of proposed laws that may affect the quality of life for Hawaii residents. On the next Insights on PBS Hawaii, what should the 2014 state legislature do for Hawaii? That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Malia Maddock. Ahui ho!